Welcome to the next installment of our French and Indian War Regimental History. Now, previously we talked about the Virginia Regiment, probably the longest tenured provincial unit from the conflict. Now we're going to delve into the biographies of some of that regiment's officers. Now, what better place to start than with George Washington's very first second in command? We're going to be talking about Colonel Adam Stephen. Stephen had a military career to stretch to 30 years. There's a lot to unpack with this guy. Uh, a lot of it unknown legacy they left behind. Some of it, some controversy he didn't want you to know about. We're going to get into all of it before this video is done. Now, just like the previous video, this is an audio heavy video presentation i'll try my best to keep your eyes entertained with some visuals to depict what we're talking about but i don't even have a portrait to work with there is no known portrait of colonel stephen darn so to the best of my abilities we're going to go through his life his exploits and some of the things that he doesn't want you to know about adam stephen hailed from scotland although his year of birth is disputed between 1718 through 1730. Information of his life before emigrating from Europe has become fragmented, but some segments can be fretted. He was raised in a family with at least one brother by the name of Alexander. He received a classical education from King's College of the University of Aberdeen before studying medicine at the University of Edinburgh. The latter studies positioned a young Stephen for military service with Britain's entry into the War of Austrian Succession in the 1740s. In that conflict, he operated as a surgeon for the Royal Navy. While his service originally confined him to hospital ships, Stephen claims to have been more directly involved with the fighting. In one occurrence, he took charge of a battery of nine-pounders in his ship captain's quarters, giving him his first taste of direct combat. Following his service, Stephen turned down an offer to work for the East India Trading Company, choosing instead to move to the American colonies and be employed as a physician. The fallout of the Jacobite Rebellion in his native country may have quickened this move. Historians largely agree that Adam Stephen made his arrival to the colony of Virginia in 1748, establishing his practice in Fredericksburg. His abilities to treat ulcers and rheumatism spread quickly across northern Virginia, reaching the parlors of nobility such as Lord Thomas Fairfax. It was through this affluent connection that George Washington would get his first impression of the man that would one day become his second in command, that being a braggart whose self-confidence was backed by tales of past adventures and service for the crown. By 1750, Stephen had succeeded in becoming a landowner, receiving a tract of property from Lord Fairfax near present-day Lee Town, West Virginia. But if Virginia's land claims in the West came under threat of conquest by France, it became apparent Stephen was soon to return to military service. On February 25, 1754, Stephen was commissioned as captain in the Virginia Regiment, soon ordered to help fortify the Forks of the Ohio. Throughout the spring of 1754, his company assisted in clearing a roadway for British armed forces to the banks of the Monongahela River. These efforts, however, were paused with reports of a party of French soldiers nearing the Virginian encampment at Great Meadows. Stephen claims they had been put in command of the left wing of the detachment George Washington led to Jumonville Glen on May 28, 1754, making Stephen a participant in the first shots that were fired to start the French and Indian War. Attempts to put the ensuing incident behind him failed, as a scouting force authorized by Stephen announced the French force that had recently occupied the Forks of Ohio to be at least several hundred. With a promotion to major, Stevens assisted in laying out the defenses at the Great Meadows encampment. As Washington's second-in-command, Stephen was inundated with challenges when a franco amerindian force assaulted Fort Necessity on July 3, 1754. The swivel guns, which the Virginia Assembly hoped would give their troops leverage, were in Stephen's charge. Though they had torn down a portion of the stockade to improve the field of fire, these guns were largely ineffective as the enemy had no intention of doing battle beyond the tree line. By nightfall, the situation for the Virginians was hopeless and an offer of parley was accepted. According to Stephen, the terms for surrender the French had offered was difficult to decipher on account of the rain blotting the ink and hampering the candlelight. In a later recollection, Stephen claimed to have abstained from signing the capitulation on grounds he found the language incriminating of assassination. 
It should be noted, however, that the signatures on the document only belong to the commanding officials of either side. The following day, Stephen would chafe with the capitulation once more when he struck a French soldier who was carrying off his regimental coat. The French could hardly believe Stephen was an officer on account of the mud and powder that had soiled his appearance, compelling the Major to don his regimental coat over his wet clothes in the retreat from Great Meadows. In the wake of the 1754 Ohio Expedition, Stephen's rank was reduced to captain. While Washington resigned in frustration, Stephen maintained his occupation and rank. In 1755, Stephen would find himself in charge of a ranger company attached to the army of General Edward Braddock. While Washington was invited to be by Braddock's side as a volunteer aide-de-camp, Stephen supervised his company in guarding and clearing the advance. Initially, his company was to be held in reserve in the vicinity of Chestnut Ridge, while Braddock advanced with a brigade of troops toward Fort Duquesne. But when orders were received for a convoy of supplies to be pushed to the front, Stevens' company were made part of this escort. In addition to needed provisions, Stevens' wagons also carried an ale Washington to reunite with Braddock in the lead column. Stephen was successful in covering nearly 40 miles in two days, receiving an ovation upon his arrival at Braddock's camp. On July 9, 1755, Stephen's company made up the rear guard of Braddock's army as it crossed the Monongahela River. The vanguard of that British force quickly came under fire from a franco amerindian party, sending the main column rushing forward into the retreating ranks. Redcoats plowing into one another created a disaster, with Braddock unable to deploy his regulars as desired. While the ranger companies were ineffective in achieving victory, they managed to stave off total annihilation. With the general wounded mortally, Washington took charge of the army and ordered the ranger captains to conduct a delay in action back to the river. These efforts resulted in considerable losses, with Stephen reporting a third of his number wiped out, but opened an avenue for retreat. Stephen did not escape unscathed, receiving multiple wounds. None, however, would prove life-threatening. The Virginia Regiment was reunified to protect the colony's frontier in the wake of Braddock's defeat. With Adam Stephen attained the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, Washington tasked him with reorganizing the soldiers at Virginia's westernmost outpost, Fort Cumberland. But cementing his jurisdiction fell into a clerical nightmare. There were multiple officers with different commissions at that garrison, with one particularly quarrelsome. Captain John Dagworthy, in charge of 40 Marylanders, claimed to have superiority over Stephen's rank. Dagworthy's credentials were a royal commission he had received prior to the war. Although later proven to be a commission that elapsed, the two officers could not reach an understanding. It would take a personal trip from Washington to go to Boston in order to convince Commander of North America, William Shirley, to order Dagworthy into respecting Stephen's rank. By the time Shirley had made this decree, spring of 1756 had come to the frontier. Complications had multiplied for Stephen, often writing of Ameridian war parties threatening the garrison and making appeals for reinforcements. But being distant from Virginia's fear of commerce made receiving those resources difficult. Washington hoped to relocate the entire regiment from Fort Cumberland to a new outpost in Winchester, Virginia. This relocation was a tough sell to the colony's assembly, as confusion over whose jurisdiction covered Fort Cumberland persisted. In October, Stephen hosted a council of war with Virginian officers to stress their opinions on the matter. It was ultimately decided to construct a new base, which became Fort Loudoun, while agreeing to maintain a Virginian detachment at Fort Cumberland. For Stephen, maintaining a body of men to construct the defenses proved unviable, a pandemic of desertion spread to all positions of the Virginia Regiment. According to correspondence with Washington, Stephen was busier in collecting fugitives of the regiment than contesting the enemy. Efforts to ease the quota only upset Stephen, for the Assembly's modified plan dissolved the Ranger companies that provided the regiment with its most experienced officers. As distress grew commonplace, Washington's confidence in Stephen waned. By spring of 1757, rumors came to Stephen's attention of his commanding officer speaking poorly of him in private. Soon after, he was transferred to South Carolina to be under command of Colonel Henry Bouquet in an aborted campaign against the Shawnee. 
While Virginia could only fill half of the Crown's quota of manpower, the reassignment must have been refreshful for the stressed Scotsman. He proudly dressed in full lace suits soon after disembarking in Charleston, but the relocation quickly proved as tedious as home, for his detachment went without pay for four long months. In 1758, Stephen would return north to participate in Britain's latest offensive against Fort Duquesne. At Fort Loudoun, he assisted in the consolidation of the 1st Virginia Regiment. This also brought him in the periphery of the campaign's quartermaster, John St. Clair. Both men were familiar with the other from Braddock's campaign, where St. Clair was frustrated of Stephen's recruitment of a Catholic amongst the ranks of his rangers. Further, St. Clair was vocal of the Stevens dagworthy affair at Fort Cumberland, accusing the lieutenant colonel of breaching military discipline. Three years had done little to change that adversity. Stephen was assigned five companies of Virginians to lead to Fort Bedford in Pennsylvania and commence construction of a supply road across Allegheny Mountain. Although a quartermaster had no place in ordering soldiers in the field, concern of the roadways his supplies were to traverse made St. Clair a constant force amongst Stephen's detachment. The work party spent the month of August clearing trees, bridging streams, and constructing redoubts in protecting their advance toward Laurel Mountain. The wilderness they labored in was in want only of a cerebus to represent Virgil's gloomy depiction of the infernal regions. Although the work was exhausting, St. Clair remained critical of their progress. Stephen claimed the quartermaster had usurped his command by repeated orders to fortify a previous campsite made redundant by the road's extension to Laurel Mountain. Both Stephen and St. Clair gave conflicting accounts of what followed. It appears a difference in opinion on the work party's objective soon escalated into a shouting match, culminating with the lieutenant colonel being impounded on the charge of mutiny. Had this been an isolated affair, Stephen may very well face severe consequence, but this argument was just the latest in a series of quarrels St. Clair had with colonial officers. Stephen was also in the good graces of the Army's junior commander, Colonel Henry Bouquet, from their stay in South Carolina. Wanting to avert a fragmentation of the Army between colonial and royal lines, St. Clair was scolded while Stephen was acquitted. Because of his arrest, Stephen was spared in taking part in the doomed reconnaissance of Major James Grant of Fort Duquesne. In the aftermath of the September 14th assault, Stephen led a rescue party that located several survivors that scattered into the countryside west of the British latest stronghold, Fort Ligonier. It would be from this position that Stephen was fixed till a larger push toward the forks in November succeeded in taking Fort Duquesne without incident. In 1759, the Virginia Regiment was returned to a single unit, with Colonel William Byrd becoming Stephen's commander. Yet Stephen was also answering to crown needs in Pennsylvania. When the mountain passes cleared in winter, Stephen was ordered by Bouquet to use 300 Virginians to supply runs for forts guarding the approach to the forks of the Ohio. Hopes for quick movement were dashed when he discovered the passage that had caused them such headache in the previous campaign needed a new bridge. Harassment from enemy war parties kept Stephen confined to Fort Bedford until summer while want of wagons constricted the progress of shipments. By this point in his career, however, these hardships had become commonplace. By 1761, the monotony of the military pressed Stephen to pursue other career prospects. In the wake of King George III's coronation, new elections were held for the House of Burgesses. Adam Stevens sought a seat from Frederick County. There was a hope that such a position could secure land grants Virginian officers had been promised at the onset of the war. Stephen's primary opponent was George Washington. Their relationship was no longer amicable on account of competing ventures and land speculation. The lack of faith Washington displayed in the final years commanding Stephen did not help matters. Stephen's platform promoted financial schemes he assured would bring an influx of gold to Frederick County, schemes which Washington balked at. More infuriating to Washington was Stevens decrying his former colonel as a political mouthpiece for the county's elite, whilst the Scotsman promoted himself as a friend to the poor. Stevens' rhetoric pressed Washington to scorn him as unprincipled. The former commanding officer of the Virginia Regiment convinced the county sheriff to manipulate voter entry to the polls. On election day, the first 14 of 15 voters announced their support for Washington, 
swaying the rest of the pool against Stephen and out of his chance into politics, at least for this occasion. Frustrated in politics, Stephen returned to the Virginia Regiment and received a new assignment. Conflict between the Cherokee and the Carolinian colonists threatened to spill into Virginia. After suffering several defeats in the Carolina backcountry, British High Command drafted a multi-pronged incursion into Cherokee land. Virginia's prong called for a movement into the Tennessee River Valley from the northeast. Stephen led Virginian soldiers to the long island of the Holston River, overseeing construction of an outpost. He also ascended to the rank of colonel, solidifying him as the commanding officer of the entire outfit. Routed and engaged in battle, Stephen's force along the Holston engaged in diplomatic endeavors that garnered new peace terms between the Cherokee and Virginia. Stephen would authorize a small expedition led by Henry Timberlake to travel to several villages and explain the new terms, with Timberlake's diary providing historians critical descriptions of Cherokee life. By 1763, Stephen was overseeing routine supply convoys for Crown forces at Fort Bedford that pulled from personal stores in Virginia. This was despite efforts from the House of Burgesses in returning the regiment to militia status to save expenditures. That summer saw a resurgence in hostilities occur in the Ohio River Valley, known as Pontiac's War. At the advisement of Colonel Bouquet, the commander of North America, Jeffrey Amherst, requested Stephen to raise enough militiamen to support an aggressive counteroffensive down the Ohio following the Battle of Bushy Run. While enthusiastic about his assignment, Stephen soon complained of the avenues British High Command expected his mission to be financed with. Bouquet's counteroffensive was postponed until autumn of 1764, but once more financial uncertainty frustrated Stephen. He felt that the threat of desertion was so dire, he announced his willingness to formally discharge the men under his command if it meant they would have the right to some compensation from the Virginia Assembly. In Williamsburg, accusations swept across the House of Burgesses and Stephen was discouraging the militia from supporting Bouquet for artillier motives, leading to the colonel having free charges levied against his name. While certain movements of supplies were found to be a fault of improper intelligence, the subcommittee agreed Stephen's forays into Pennsylvania unlawful on account of placing Virginia militia beyond the colony's boundary. However, he would be allowed to retain his command. In the wake of the French and Indian War, Stephen maintained a place in the militia, but devoted considerable attention to land speculation. He was one of 50 members that made up the Mississippi Land Company, founded in 1763 to seek a land grant northeast of the confluence between the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. While the company made multiple appeals to the crown, no headway was gained. At home, he had better success with the acquisition of land along Tuscarora Creek. In 1772, this land became part of a new county named Berkeley, with Stephen being commissioned its inaugural sheriff. However, the governor who commissioned Stephen, Lord Dunmore, became unpopular with Virginians because of his staunch support for royal policy. When Dunmore ordered the dissolution of the House of Burgesses, a new convention was held in the summer of 1774. While this convention was held at Williamsburg's Raleigh Tavern, Stephen was assisting the governor in organizing an army to subdue the Shawnee and Mingo people following several acts of violence along the Ohio River. The ensuing conflict, known as Lord Dunmore's War, was brief, with Stephen's regiment not seeing combat. It nevertheless saw him function in once more second in command of a combat force, a distinction soon to become a critical trait. By 1775, it was inevitable that the American colonies were going to go to war with the British sovereign. For Stephen, the intolerable acts passed by Parliament to control the rebellious factions of Massachusetts would only produce a British America where colonists were at the mercy of royal villains. As sheriff, he prepared his neighbors for conflict within Berkeley County's Committee of Safety. He was successfully nominated to the Second Virginia Convention, being witness to Patrick Henry's famed declaration to be given liberty or death. With war in full force after Lexington and Concord, Stephen was nominated to the Third Virginia Convention, a win he was later disqualified from when accusations were leveled at the active sheriff for manipulating the polls in his favor. Stephen and controversy were terms now well engaged. 
but did not stop the assembly from electing him colonel of the 4th Virginia Regiment in early 1776. Stephen initially focused on bolstering the defense of Hampton Roads, but soon found himself back under the command of George Washington when the 4th Virginia were ordered to New York to reinforce the Continental Army. He quickly received a promotion to Brigadier General, but his rough edges resurfaced during the critical raid on Trenton. A scouting party under his jurisdiction opened fire on Hessian sentries on the eve of the surprise attack, nearly unraveling General Washington's plan of action. Supporters of Stephen in the Continental Congress succeeded in promoting him to the rank of Major General, with Washington instructing him to defend the Roatan Valley of New Jersey. On May 10, 1777, Stephen had his chance to impress when he tried to raid the famed Black Watch, 42nd Regiment of Foot. While he boasted inflicting at least 200 casualties, Washington quickly scolded him for the numerical inflation. Despite this, Stephen was put in charge of Benjamin Lincoln's division prior to the Battle of Brandywine. In the thick of the fighting, Stephen was commended for his stance on Birmingham Hill, buying other American units enough time to retreat and avert capture by the British Army. But in the Continental Army's bid to recapture Philadelphia, an incident occurred that would cost Stephen his military career. An unexpected fog made it difficult for Stephen to lead his command to their intended rendezvous. When they instead came across an unknown body of soldiers, Stephen gave the order to fire. It quickly became apparent Stephen's men were firing on friendly detachments, compelling both columns to retreat from the battlefield and upsetting Washington's strategy as consequence. Several claim Stephen's initial response to the matter was to accuse his division of cowardice, that they had retreated from victory. He denied this statement, instead challenging General Washington to organize a court-martial to seek the truth. Stephen was granted this wish, but was found guilty of behavior unbecoming of an officer that included proof of frequent intoxication during his time in command. He was immediately dismissed from his place in the Continental Army, a distinction that would only be rivaled by future Berkeley County resident General Charles Lee. In the wake of military disgrace, Stephen devoted his energy to bolstering his power in Berkeley County. In October of 1778, an act by the Virginia Assembly recognized Stephen's layout of the new county seat along Tuscarora Creek, Martinsburg. There, he improved upon his estate, which he had laid the cornerstone for back in 72. In 1780, Stephen was elected to Virginia's House of Delegates, serving through the end of the Revolutionary War. He would return to politics in 1788 as a delegate to Virginia's Ratification Convention for the Constitution, a document of government Stephen endorsed with evocative speeches. After a tumultuous life spanning five separate conflicts, Adam Stevens succumbed to his age at 1791. Several of his assets were bestowed to Anne Hunter, his only known child. One more thing I want to add, I just... I just love this thought that Berkeley County, which today has since been divided up even smaller, but Berkeley County in the 18th century was home to three particular Revolutionary War officers. We know Adam Stephen. I also mentioned Charles Lee settled there. And Horatio Gates. All three guys lived in the same county, and all three guys were critics of George Washington. And I believe they did have at least one dinner in 1782 at the very end of uh, Lee's life, they all three sat together at a dinner table, and it must have been the most awkward dinner of all time. Well, thank you guys for tuning in and watching this video, this biography of Colonel Stephen, as we continue exploring the history of the Virginia Regiment and the French and Indian War. If you want to be the first notified when a new video like this comes out, hit the subscribe button down below, subscribe to Readout Productions. Also, be sure to hit the like button to let the algorithm know that you do want to see history videos on this platform. And just so you know, uh, we are starting a membership tier. So this is kind of a soft beginning of the membership. I'm going to do a hard announcement when we get to February. I'm trying to get a few final benefits put together. But right now, you can join the garrison of Readout Productions. 
for $2 a month, you will be able to support the garrison. You are going to get a uh, access to select scripts, such as the script to this very video, because it is annotated to holy hell, and I want it to be used as a historical document for other people, so they don't have to go through the drama that I want to produce, produce in this. Uh, you're also going to get a monthly digital postcard. Essentially, what you'll be getting, you'll be getting behind-the-scenes photographs from the various historical sites we travel to with a little write-up about it sent to your email box and you will get your name featured at the end credits so somewhere maybe here or there or maybe i won't even be on screen there should be a garrison name and your will your name shall appear underneath it and of course you'll have my enduring gratitude for showing support to this channel so if you want to become part of the garrison link is in the description to ko down below thank you guys for watching We'll see you in the next video.